welcome to the Reasonable Theology Podcast, where we present sound doctrine in plain language. We're here to help you better understand, articulate, and live out the fullness of the Christian faith. And now, here's your host, Clay Craby. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining us. On this episode, we are speaking with Mark Jones. He's the senior minister at Faith Vancouver Presbyterian Church. He's the author and editor of a number of books, and he speaks all over the world on the topic uh, of Christian living. He's also the author of Knowing Sin, Seeing a Neglected Doctrine Through the Eyes of the Puritans. So, Mark Jones, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Great to be on with you. Thanks for having me. As we kick things off, could you spend a moment and share a little bit about yourself and your family and your ministry? Yes, I'm a pastor at Faith Vancouver uh, Presbyterian Church. We are a PCA church, Presbyterian Church in America, and um, we have two sites right now because in Vancouver, uh, there's no land. So when your church, um, you grow out of your church building, you need to go find another building. And uh, so we have a a Surrey site where I preach 9 a.m. in the morning there, and then I drive into Vancouver to our Vancouver site, preach there. And uh, it's it's been really encouraging the last few years, especially our, our our church growth and just young people and and really seeing the gospel work. I also like to write as a hobby and coach soccer, so I, I do quite a bit of coaching. And then uh, occasionally I travel around the world to um, conferences when I feel it's uh, a valuable use of uh, time and 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 resources. And then I have uh, four kids, um, a wife and. Other than that, not much else. Oh, well, that sounds like plenty to, to stay on top of. So you mentioned writing, uh, and you have a new book that's out, and it's on how the Puritans viewed and taught about the subject of sin. So what brought about your desire to write a book on the topic of sin? few things really struck me. One was uh, I wanted to write a book because it keeps me out of trouble or uh, at least I, it keeps me a bit more busy. So um, I kind of felt like I had a period of time where I could devote a few months to some sustained writing. And then I had done a lot of research through my previous studies on the Puritans. And so once you, you get into the thick of the Puritans, there's a lot of research that you, you keep in your back pocket, so to speak. And as a pastor uh, and someone who does travel a bit and tries to stay attuned to what's going on, I just thought that, that it was really important to have a, a fresh look at the doctrine of sin. It's one of those doctrines that I think gets missed out in our preaching and even in our uh, prayer life and just our awareness of who we are. So just a number of factors came together for me to uh, write the book. And thankfully, Moody seemed quite keen on it. And it's been, um, you know, so far so good. Now, the title will probably strike someone's ear right off the bat. I anticipate that knowing sin is kind of an intentional homage to to J.I. Packer's knowing God. Is that right? Or just happy coincidence? Yeah, well, I had also uh, written a book called Knowing Christ, and J.I. Packer wrote the foreword to that. And I kind of thought, okay, we started with Knowing God, and then I specifically wrote a book, Knowing Christ. And then Knowing Sin was um, sort of a... Uh, a, a companion volume, as it were, to to that. So I might keep going with the the knowing series. Um, we'll see. But yeah, that's uh, that's the short um, story. That's great. We'll be sure to link to to your previous, you know, knowing Christ as well in the show notes. As you're listening to this and you're uh, hearing some resources mentioned, and you want to keep track of those, you can always head to the show notes at reasonabletheology.org. So we are talking about your book, Knowing Sin. You've got this previous book, Knowing Christ, and of course there's J.I. Packer's Knowing God. Do you see these topics, particularly knowing God, knowing Christ, and knowing sin, as kind of the foundational aspects of, of strong, good theology? Yeah, I think there's the, the, what you see in the, the historic writings, you know, even beginning with Calvin, but, uh, you know, going through the churches, you know, we, we, got, we have to understand who is God is... is fundamental but who are we and you know when you understand who we are uh, truly according to how God's word uh, looks at humans whether in Christ or out of Christ um, you see your need for God but then when you see who God is you see how we fall so very far short of his perfection so I think those are the sort of twin pillars of, of, of true knowledge and then in the middle of that knowing Christ is the the link between the 
knowing God and knowing sin. And, you know, if you didn't have knowing Christ, uh, knowing sin and knowing God would actually be a very brutal Mm. uh, uh, couple of doctrines. But Christ brings them together in a way we can have joy and hope and peace. Amen. Now, this isn't a book with just your ideas of sin or even just the result of your study of Scripture on sin, though there's plenty of that in there, but particularly on insights gained from the Puritans and their writings about sin. So uh, two questions. One, what made you uh, interested in kind of looking at it through the lens of the Puritans, and what do what unique insights do they bring to this conversation? I think the Puritans were... Uh, especially gifted with uh, not just learning whereby they they were well read well studied well taught but they they seem to have a pastoral uh, manner about them so that when they wrote it wasn't just mere academic theology but it was devotional theology and so sometimes you'll see them say certain phrases or comments and it's 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 evocative it's it really strikes you the language they use and and leaves memories uh in your head vivid vivid illustrations and so on so i think the puritans for me uh combine the balance between good theology and pastoral application and they do so with a vividness in their writing that it's quite striking compared to uh, other eras of the church in my in my mind and of course, they kind of get a bad rap uh, if if some people are familiar just with the caricature of Puritans being very uh, dour and very uh, strict. Uh, what would you say to someone who maybe has not approached a study of the Puritans or reading some of their works, and even that word Puritan is almost a, a negative for them? Could you help get them over that hurdle and just encourage them not only to read your book, just to be exposing themselves to the Puritans? For me, the the striking thing uh, in terms of the Puritans is the, the caricatures are, are you know they, they they exist. I mean, there's also a wide group of, of Christians, at least in North America, who who love the Puritans, and then there's some who don't know them so well, and and seems like the haunting fear that somebody somewhere is having a good time is this fear of the Puritans, which really doesn't live up to what you read about the Puritans and. Um, the types of things they wrote about uh, don't really give me that impression. There were some areas where I think they were a little more uh, stricter than the average uh, Christian today in North America. And I, I think that's more an indictment upon us than them, to be honest. But uh, I would say that uh, their teachings on Christ, for example, I did my PhD dissertation on Thomas Goodwin's Christology. If you, if you read Goodwin's, um, work on Christ. It's the most heartwarming, soul-satisfying uh, work that uh, I've read in the English language. And so anyone who you know has a bad view of the Puritans needs to really try and give them a chance, because I did, and I found that nothing has satisfied my soul in terms of human writings like uh, Thomas Goodwin and, and John Owen. Now, we do have a resource on the blog Let's draw people's attention to, is just reading the Puritans, Where to Start?, and it's just a recommendation of some some good entry level ways to get your uh, kind of foot in the door, so to speak, of engaging with the Puritans. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes for you. But my question for you is, you've mentioned this Thomas Goodwin work. Are there other particular Puritan works that come to mind that you'd recommend for gaining a better understanding of particularly this topic of sin? Probably Thomas Watson would be the the guy who he's clear and he's got great phrases, a great turn of phrase. So I would highly recommend Thomas Watson. I have edited Stephen Charnock's Existence and Attributes of God and modernized it and updated it and um, done a lot of work to translate phrases and words and give definitions of archaic words. And that will be coming out with Crossway later this year. So I would say, you know, um, start off with Watson, maybe, but you can also jump into Charnock, uh, Stephen Charnock on the attributes of God. And, uh, you know, others such as John Flavel, uh, quite good. Uh, oh, and you need to, you know, take your time and maybe uh, get to, you know, uh, a point where you understand the, the language of Puritan writers before you dive into him. But there's some pretty good modern editions of their work. So, 
Um, I would just poke around. Banyan is, is, is obviously a great place to start in terms of Pilgrim's Progress and Holy War. So there's, there's plenty of places to get your feet wet. Yeah, and as much as as we would recommend people read the Puritan works and benefit by them, you can't get around that they were writing a long time ago. Um, They're known for uh, very long titles and subtitles, very long sentences. Obviously, there's going to be some archaic uh, grammar and things. So it... It's not without its challenges, but it's very, very fruitful to be reading the Puritans. Yeah, yeah, it's like going for a, a run and you you throw some hills in, and you know when you're done, you feel really good about um, you know the fact that you you got up those hills and and made it. And I think the Puritans are like that. They it's like hill running, um, but you're always thankful at the end. Yeah, absolutely. It takes a little bit more work. It is not light reading most of the time. But even as you work slowly through these works, you're going to recognize the benefit, even as you're reading them. This isn't just put the book down and then later in life you look back and see. I mean, you're benefiting them as you're working through them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So by by writing this book on sin, by bringing these Puritan perspectives and their writings on sin— you're, you're trying to help the reader gain a better understanding of the problem of sin. Are there some misunderstandings that you're attempting to address with this book? A little bit, yes. I think there's a few, maybe off the top of my head. One would be, you know, people uh, like to uh, use euphemisms, but they also will come up with phrases that are sort of half-truths about sin. So, um, you know, even for example, sin is missing the mark. Well, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, on a very, very basic level, you could say sin is missing the mark, but it's so much more than that. Um, and so I have chapters in there that uh, highlight what sin is, what it isn't. Uh, I think also people tend to externalize sin. It's a natural human uh, propensity. The, the Pharisees did that, you know, they thought they were good people because they externalized sin, whereas Christ in the Sermon on the Mount internalizes the problem of sin, and so does David in Psalm 51, for example. So people think about um, inward temptations, and they say, well, those aren't sins because I never actually did anything. And and I think, you know, what I try to show is how, you know, certain inward temptations actually are sin if we are bringing them about through uh, meditating upon evil and thinking about evil and, and, and so on. So, yeah, there's a few um, ways I'm trying to correct our popular conceptions. Absolutely. Could you expand on that a little bit more? I'm just he- interested to hear your um, your further thought on that externalizing versus internalizing sin. It, could you expand on that a little bit more in terms of what it means to externalize sin and the problems that, that can create for us? The The... the way I kind of like to approach this is in terms of, of Christ himself. So he was tempted, and we have to remember what does that mean. And, and I think what we find with Christ is that there were external temptations. Absolutely, the devil solicited him in a time of weakness where he's hungry, thirsty, so on. So there's these external temptations that come to Christ, and he doesn't give in to them. Uh, however, unlike Christ... There is an analogy that breaks down. So he was tempted in every way that we are in terms of, I think, those external temptations. We also have indwelling sin. And so our our will will be often led astray by desires. uh, And they are defiled desires or they are um, desires that are not in accordance with God's law. So if I desire to steal something from somebody... That desire is a a wrong-headed desire. It's a sinful desire. It's a bad impulse. And I need to deal with that because really what leads to actual sins, the committing of an actual sin, are the inward sins that we allow to reign unchecked. So it's vital as a Christian that we deal with the root of the problem right to the heart and we um, crush it by the Spirit in accordance with the means that God has provided And then we can actually have some victories in our lives in terms of how we live. But until we get to the root of the problem, we're just putting band-aids over uh, open wounds. Hmm. And as, you know, the individual reader, the individual Christian starts to try to get at the root of the problem, they're going to start to see the sins that they struggle with in particular. Are there particular sins that Christians in our day seem especially to struggle with? 
That's a that's a tricky question, and I think in a sense it depends where you live. But what the Puritans taught me is our stage of life, whether we're young or old, will yield various temptations to certain sins. Uh, people who are rich will have certain sins. People who are poor will have certain sins. And because sin is so ugly and, and powerful and real, uh, we have to insist that the seed of every sin is in our heart. So given the right time, circumstance, apart from the grace of God, we could do any sin. But at the same time, uh, a young teenage boy is going to have uh, problems dealing with lust in a way that a, a five-year-old boy probably won't experience in the same way, right? So um, a, an elderly gentleman uh, might have different um, types of sins that he never struggled with as a child. And, and so what we need to do is distinguish um, even the sexes, male and female, have different types of um, proclivities and, and, and sins that they commit. Uh, I think, you know, if you just looked at uh, something like um, violent anger that leads to, to fighting, you would see that as more of a male sin, right? Just because of um, how we're created. So I think uh, there's that's important to understand. And then I think in Western culture, we may have sins that um, are a result of the affluence of our culture, maybe um, other things that... Uh, you wouldn't see in in different cultures, so it's it's a complex question and and quite worthy of discussion. I think. Now, some might be hearing the premise of the book, and they may have a fleeting thought of, well, what can the Puritans tell me about my modern day challenges? If people think through, uh, you know, areas that they are weak or struggling with sin, and they're thinking of, you know, temptations online or. Uh, just you know, time management and making time for spiritual disciplines with all the things that we have that demands our time that just the Puritans couldn't have even imagined in terms of internet and the phone ringing and all these things. What would you say to someone who has a, a little bit of doubt that going so far back to the Puritans is a great place to start for understanding our sin? Has sin changed that much over the years? I think that's a fair question. I'm not here to say, well, uh, you know, this, there's no merit to that. I, you know, there are struggles. Even in my own life, I recognize that if I had a phone, a smartphone, when I was 15, as opposed to now, I, I might have got myself put in jail or real serious trouble because I was so immature. And now kids have these these temptations. But uh, what I think is crucial for us to understand is the the essence of sin doesn't change. So the basic principles of of idolatry, of going after something other than God or putting something before God, um, the essence of uh, laziness. And that's it may manifest itself differently today in terms of laziness, like watching TV for a long time. But I think the Puritans understood laziness in terms of whatever um, issues they may have had to, to deal with. So the principles don't change. Uh, what we see in David's life, what we see in Peter's life, fear of man, um, concern for self at the expense of others, those those principles don't change. So we say the internal um, driving principles of sin never change from age to age. And the outward um, sort of manifestation where it could be watching too much TV or too much time on your phone, uh, those things can differ, the accidents, so to speak. But um, yeah, I, I'm happy to admit differences, but I'm also insistent upon the core principles don't really change. You know, Solomon's life um, in Ecclesiastes is as relevant to us today as it was back then. Yeah, the roots problem and the heart of our sin, that doesn't really change. We're still struggling with the same problems that they were struggling with in Moses' day. We just have uh, different contexts that that plays out in. One of the things that your, your book does that's helpful is it it gives the distinction between sins of commission and sins of omission. Could you define both of those and then explain a little bit what that's about? Very basically, you know, sin of commission is something you actually commit. So if I were to to steal a, a, an orange from the grocery store, I would be committing a sin. Uh, now, if, for example, I saw an old lady lying on the ground outside my house and she couldn't get up and I was in my office looking out the window and just saying, oh, well, you know, hope, hopefully this 
uh, she gains some strength and gets herself up and moves along. That would be a sin of omission because I'm omitting a duty to to care for someone, to show love, to um, you know that the, the do not kill is also preserve life. And so we have duties that are required of us, and then we have uh, other duties whereby we shouldn't do things. So in terms of Christ, again, I think this is really crucial. What amazes me about Christ's life is both that he didn't commit any sins, but not only did he not commit sins, he also did everything that was required of him at every stage of his life. He was always pleasing the Father. He was always speaking the exact words the Father gave to him. Uh, There was never an instance where he failed to do his duty. And so we need to understand that the Christian life is not just a negative don't do this, but it's a positive. What should we do? And Ephesians 4 is a great chapter for that. If you want a quick glance at Paul uh, looking at what we shouldn't do and then coupling that with what we should do in, in, in place of the things that we shouldn't do. Now, this, this process of studying about, looking at the Puritans, reading a book like yours about sin uh, is, is not a theoretical one. It's not simply, though it is theological and doctrinal, it's not only that, in what ways does having a greater grasp of our sinfulness actually deepen our Christian life? For me, the, the the scriptures are quite clear that where you see great declarations of God's grace, you see often declarations of man's sinfulness. So, you know, in Exodus, uh, we, we see this. We see this in Isaiah, uh, specifically chapter 6, but all through Isaiah. Um, you know, Peter saying, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Uh, you know, it, there's so many places, David in Psalm 51 ransacks the biblical vocabulary for sin, but then it's outdone by the biblical vocabulary for grace. So when you see uh, an emphasis, a biblical true and proper emphasis upon sin, you very often find uh, an emphasis upon how um, God, salvation, mercy, compassion, faithfulness, love, etc., are closely present, and so that's why I think the we can't really lose when we understand sin biblically, because we'll always be confronted in the same passages very often by the uh, mercies of God. And, and bringing in that aspect of being confronted with the mercy of God, the love of God, is so important because the the Puritans and you and other uh, writers and, and pastors and theologians, the point of spending time with doctrine of sin is not just only to recognize how terrible we are apart from Christ, though that I think is is absolutely necessary, um, but there is also encouragement on the other side of that. So what encouragements do we gain particularly from the Puritans, even in the midst of a heavy topic like sin and its consequences? Uh the encouragements, I think, you know, the Puritans, what they did so well with sin is, is they, they, they didn't hold back when they described it. There's no like, um, you know, uh, sanitizing of the topic. But what they do so well is, is, is they bring out the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of the Spirit always in connection with that. And so, you know, when you look at how Goodwin will write, for example, speaking of Christians, that uh, our sins move Christ more to pity than to anger. Uh, It's not that he can't ever be disappointed and displeased with us, but there's always a sense in which there's more pity and more grace um, to those who, you know, feel the weight of their sins. So there's some very practical um, conclusions we can draw from the doctrine of sin in terms of how it leads us to Christ, and then the specific ways in which Christ is intercessor, Christ as Savior on the cross, Christ as resurrected, or the Spirit um, functions in our day-to-day Christian living, even in terms of our confession of our sins um, and how we can feel refreshed by the fact that God accepts us for the sake of his Son. So really crucial to, to locate all of the solutions to sin in Christ and the Spirit based upon the Father's love. Mm, that's great. Now, what is it that you hope readers take away from this book? They, they picked up a copy and they, they've read through it. What is the primary takeaway that you hope they'll have? 
there would be hopefully a few takeaways. I, I think I'd like the readers to feel like they got into a ring with Mike Tyson for a few minutes and, you know, uh, <laughs> feel like they've been hit. And then, uh, I, I mean, that sounds bleak, but really I do want readers to feel uh, hammered by uh, the doctrine of sin because that fresh awakening to who we are by nature will, I pray, lead to a fresh awakening of how deep, you know, the Father's love is and how wide his mercy is and and how Christ is the only hope to um, getting us to a position where we can stand before a holy God. So that's to me, is a, a fresh uh, awakening to who we are, but also a fresh awakening to who God is in Christ towards us. And if, if that's all that happens, I think that is all that needs to happen in terms of Christian living. And it's so important what you mentioned of, of not wanting to pull that punch and not wanting to uh, to give in to the urge to to soften the blow because you know it's hard, but so much harm has been done in the history of the church by trying to minimize sin. Isn't that right? Yes, yes. And you, you, you'll find, you know, that it's always a, a temptation. It's always a trick of the devil. Uh, you know, if we can... I think if people go to church and they hear, oh, we're sinners and Christ died on the cross, there's a sense in which that's um, not really how the Bible tries to describe. There is a sense in which we can summarize it that way, but you find the Bible gets to specific sins. And what we need to do is not hold back on specific sins. Uh, I think a lot of Christians are okay with generalities, but when you get to someone's pride or their unbelief or their um, lust or their other disordered desires in the specifics, that's where you start to find a bit of pushback. And that's where conviction really takes place is in the specifics. So that's another thing that I think we have to remember to really insist upon locating specific sins in our life, not just the general principle. It's always more comfortable to to stay within the vague arenas of, of being general with our sin, isn't it? So where can listeners go to learn a little bit about you and your ministry? Uh, I pre uh, we actually just been put on Spotify, our, our, our church sermons, Faith uh, Vancouver. I don't even know what the address is. I just found out the other day. But um, Faith Van, F-A-I-T-H-V-A-N, faithvan.com. Uh, that's our church website. Uh, I do have an Amazon author page uh, that um, people can go check out some of the books there. Uh, Knowing Sin is, is obviously on there. I think Westminster uh, Books and also Heritage Books and a number of other Christian booksellers are, are selling it. And it's, um, yeah, it's been really well received so far in terms of sales and uh, feedback and things like that. So, you know, it's in this day and age, it's pretty easy to find information online. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that and encouraging all the, the listeners of this episode to pick up a copy of Knowing Sin. Our guest on this episode has been Mark Jones, again, Senior Minister at Faith Vancouver Presbyterian Church, author of Knowing Sin, Seeing a Neglected Doctrine Through the Eyes of the Puritans. I encourage you to pick up a copy, read through it, take the time to go through it slowly so that you might be impacted the way um, the Puritans have really grasp the depth of sin and our need for Christ, and I trust that you will be blessed for it. So, Mark Jones, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks, Clay. Great being on with you. Thanks for listening to the Reasonable Theology Podcast. Be sure to visit reasonabletheology.org for more helpful resources on understanding, articulating, and living out the Christian faith. In addition to the show notes for this episode, you'll find articles, videos, book reviews, and much more. That's reasonabletheology.org. Hey, Clay again. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with a friend who you think might get something out of it, and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the content that we have coming up. Also, if you haven't already, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave a rating and review in your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.